the marriage issue is a good segue into, into your book, One Billion Americans. Oh, yeah. And uh, I want to talk about this, this argument in, in some detail. Um, I mean, the, the, I'll let you, you describe the detail, but the, the basic idea of this book is, you know, the, the U S should try to stay number one on the global scene for various reasons. And one of the most important ways we have to do this is to increase our population so that we are, we, we remain the world's number one economy. And then mm-hmm. you, you sort of go into the weeds to, to quote your former podcast name mm-hmm. about how we would do this and, you know, how we would increase the birth rate, how we would incentivize marriage, uh, how, how we would change our immigration policy, um, how we would deal with, you know, the, the sort of, Rust Belt cities mm-hmm. that have been uh, de- depopulating over the past, you know, fifty years. Um, so just let let's get let's get basic with the the fundamental premises here. And this may be a a, a pointless question for some people, but <laughs> why should America be the biggest economy in the world? Like why yeah. why do we have a, a morally valid case to want to remain number one? Sure. Here's the book, you know, for those on video, One Billion Americans. We've got lots of little stars here. Um, you know, I mean, there's, there's a, I think, a lot of different ways that you can think about this. Um, fundamentally, I just kind of always took for granted in life that as an American, uh, most Americans are proud. I mean, we're, we're, we're proud, you know, of our communities, of our lives, of things like that. But we're also proud of the fact that America has accomplished certain things in the world in a way that, say, New Zealand has not, right? And New Zealand's great. You know, it seems like a nice place. Uh, They're doing well. There's a million worse countries to live in than New Zealand. But the United States is a a, a great nation, you know, in, in the way that I think we all understand. And you could say, you know, we send people to the moon. We intervened decisively in the Second World War. Uh, we, we held the torch for freedom during the Cold War, right? Big things happen. The world looks to us um, and we look to ourselves to achieve greatness. Um, just during this pandemic, right? Nobody is surprised that... Uh, mRNA vaccines were developed largely in the United States and not in the Netherlands. Uh, And it's, again, it's not because of anything wrong with the Netherlands. We're just like a a big ass country. Do you have something against countries that start with N? I hate them. No, um, (laughs) you know, and and the the other country that made a substantial contribution to vaccine research is Germany, uh, which is another large country, uh, which has played a a large role in in world history, I think, you know, to more mixed results. Uh, But it's it's a (laughs) It's a big, important country. And I think that that is worth preserving just sort of on its own terms. In concrete terms, though, you know, people of all stripes, uh, Donald Trump, Barack Obama, Joe Biden, they are very concerned about competition with China. Um, And I think rightly so. Uh, China is a big, important country, also has a quite bad uh, regime. They're doing a lot of bad things. Um, And, you know, So like, why is China a big deal? Like, why do I take China competition seriously? Whereas if someone's like, oh, Matt, like you got to be terrified about Cuba. I'd say like, no, you don't really need to be terrified about Cuba. I mean, it's a kind of bad regime there, but also who cares? Uh, But we have to care about China because China is so freaking big. Uh, That's their biggest advantage in the geopolitical space. Uh, So then why why does America matter more than Canada? It's because there's 10 times more Americans than there are Canadians. It's a great strength of ours that the leaders of this country in the 18th and 19th centuries deliberately cultivated a large population. They saw it as important to bring people over from abroad, to get them settled on farms and and things like that, and to create a, a powerful country. And I think that that's an idea that we 
drifted away from because we could take it for granted. But now that the birth rate has fallen a lot, that the level of immigration has fallen a lot, but the concerns about competition with China are at a higher level than ever, it was time to sort of affirmatively make the case for what had traditionally been our policy to encourage the the growth of the population and the country. And you basically rely on this this logic of you know, whatever the, the GDP per capita has to be multiplied by the population mm-hmm. to, to get something like a comparison of how much power any two given economies have. So, you mm-hmm. know, if we have one third the population of China, China may only need to get to one third of our GDP per capita in, in order to have the world's largest economy. And I, I know there's a there's a you go into the into the details of um, you know, how we measure mm-hmm. GDP per capita and, and all of that. But without getting too in, in, in yeah, the weeds, can you out, sort yeah. of defend that sort of logic of of um, that, that sure. sort of math? I mean, you know, look, obviously both things matter, right? Um, in a lot of areas, it's the per capita that matters. So, you know, you look at Ireland, Right, which is a very high GDP per capita, uh, very small population. Um, that's important to know. I mean, the average Irish person is much better off than the average Chinese person. Um, and you can see that if you visit Ireland versus you visit China. Uh, they got bigger houses, you know, more food, uh, more cars. You know, life, life is good in Ireland. But when you're talking about big national projects, I mean, whether that's building aircraft carriers and nuclear missiles, whether it's traveling to space, whether it's financing crash programs to create vaccines, or whether it's throwing your weight around in in commercial disputes, the aggregate size matters. And that's why we hear a lot about China, you know, doing these things. We hear about the Chinese military. We hear about the Chinese vaccine development programs. We hear about China's nascent space efforts. And we hear about China saying things, you know, um, it's, um, there's no movie where James Bond uh, has to fight with Chinese spies. And that's because the movie studios need access to the Chinese market. Mm -hmm. And if they make a movie that China is mad about, they won't be able to show their movies in China, right? And so that's why in the Marvel universe, uh, they took uh, the ancient one, this Doctor Strange side character, who's Tibetan in the comics, and is played by Tilda Swinton, uh, you know, in, in in the MCU movies, because you can't have a Tibetan character uh, in your things. You can't have a Chinese bad guy. And, you know, is that the end of the world? No, you know, we're getting along, um, but it's not great. And, you know, where does it go next, right? When do we get to the point where they are saying to Disney, uh, well, look, you know, if you want to show your Marvel movies in China, um, ABC News needs to not report on genocide against Uyghurs, uh, needs to, you know, not show Taiwan as an independent country on, on a map. You know, you, you can take you to scary places. And that is the power of aggregation. So that, you know, if China can reach Bulgaria's level of economic development, they are a much larger economy than ours um, in the aggregate. And it's it's something we should take seriously. There might, uh, there may also be something to the fact that China doesn't actually. China has inherent advantages in this domain that aren't to do with population or, or GDP, because the CCP can make decisions in a unilateral way, in, in a way that the American government, I, I think, can't. Right, like just because it's the decision-making apparatus is far more centralized mm-hmm. in China because uh, it's not a free country. Yeah, right? like could 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 the ruling party in America prevent you know Bollywood filmmakers from portraying Americans in a particular way? I mean, I'm not even sure who would be making that decision or how sure. it would be made. Well, no, so. I mean that's right. I mean, also we, I mean, we shouldn't be aiming to obtain the power to. Uh, do censorship of of foreign filmmakers. Um, But what I do think we should be actually trying to do is push back against the Chinese censorship efforts. You know what I mean? I I think we, I I don't know exactly what the the precise right legislative 
mechanism is. But I think we ought to try to incentivize American-based multinationals or just global ones to not give in to those kind of Chinese pressures, right? But to make that work, we need a market that other people want even more than they want the Chinese market. And, you know, I mean, there are certain strengths uh, to their system. Um, There are also very real weaknesses to it. Uh, You know, I think that... um, We've seen increasingly that, you know, China made a lot of good uh, decisions on economics about 10 to 15 years ago that were making them look really good. And they kind of powered through the Great Recession with still tremendous growth. And, you know, people had a lot of concerns then about like the viability of the Western model. Uh, More recently, I think Chinese decision making has started to look really shaky. Uh, And of course, in America, you know, if the leaders make bad decisions, they get voted out of office um, and they worry about that and they, they try to do things that will make people happy or, or will deliver good results. Whereas in, in China, you know, she has seemed, I think, increasingly um, questionable in terms of, you know, whether his ideas are working. Uh, but, you know, it's a dictatorship. He has an iron grip on power and, and they can't get rid of him. So, you know, that's the weakness there. And I do I like I, I believe in America. Uh, but I, it's like I want Americans to believe in ourselves, you know, um, to see the virtues that this country has and the importance of um, building up more of it. To what extent does the existence of Europe lessen our burden? That the fact that Europe is a is a large economy that is on balance more aligned with our values than mm-hmm. with China's. Does that act as a kind of uh, a, a kind of something in, in our favor in this international competition? I mean, it helps. You know, I mean, Europe is there with values that are similar to ours. Japan, South Korea, Taiwan. Um, you know, to an extent, India. Right. I mean, the fact that there's this whole uh, family of liberal-ish, democratic-ish countries that are different from each other. We have different cultures, we have different institutions, but they are recognizable variations on on a theme. I mean, that's good, right? I mean, there still is some sense of like a a free world, uh, you know, quote unquote, um, that is out there. And that I think I did not write a book about like diplomacy and, you know, how to think about the U.S.-India relationship. And a a lot of that is outside my um, area of any kind of like real knowledge or expertise. But, you know, it's good, right? I mean, there is an embedded strength in democracy and freedom uh, out there in the fact that, you know, these are things that appeal to a lot of people in a lot of different places that have delivered pretty good results for a lot of people in a lot of different places. Uh, so that's great. I mean, the world may get on uh, without us, but I also just sort of wouldn't count on it. And I just, to me, like, that's not the American way. You know, it, it's not, um, uh, I don't think we want to just like pass the torch to India the way the UK sort of did to us at some point. Nothing against India, nothing against Indian people, but like, this is a really big, successful country, and like I think we should be bigger and more successful. 